1 John 4, verse 7 through 16. And let us hear the word of the Lord. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known And believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love. Abides in God. And God in him. That's for the passage. And the text that we have before us is verse 9 and verse 10. Let me reread those for a moment. In this the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Well, I invite you to have your Bibles open again to 1 John chapter 4. As we consider these words briefly of, of John in verse 9 and 10. And beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're all familiar with the phrase, uh, prove it, prove it, or show me. How many of us have heard that or said that in life? Maybe children or young people on the playground, someone says, I can do 50 push-ups without a break, and you don't believe it, so you say, prove it, show me. Or someone says, I got 100% on my history quiz or my science test, and And again, you don't believe it, so you say, show me, show us, prove it. We all understand that, don't we? This phrase, we use it so so many times and and really about so many things in our life. Also, as adults, we all understand that anyone can say anything and it not necessarily be true. That's how man is, and so we say, prove it, show us. Well, if we think of that and we consider then our text, John is writing in these verses, and he is writing about love. And the overall point is that God's people love one another. And we'll come back to that overall point later this afternoon. The call to love each other. That's the main point. But John, in developing that point, he writes about various reasons to love one another. He builds a case. And the biggest and most important reason, according to the Apostle, the biggest and most important reason has to do with the nature of God himself. The nature of God and the fact that God is love. That's why I love one another. And John, he writes about that in verse 8. He who does not love, he says, does not know God. For God is love. And so we are to love each other because our God is a God of love. Even we can say, John says, God is love. Of course, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Very profound. Love being so essential to God. and Very familiar to us. We we know it, and yet we sense there's there's mystery here, and there's glory and, and greatness. And then at the same time, there may be the question, well, how exactly do we know that God is love? I mean, apart from this text and And the statement that God is love, how do we know it? How do we know that John isn't just saying this? And John answers that. And John tells us in our text, verses 9 and 10, John sets before us the proof that God 
God, well, we can even say it like this, God himself through John is proving that he is love and that he loves us, all his people, all who trust him. Here we can find it in verse 9 and 10, can't we? In this, the love of God was manifested or shown or revealed towards us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And then John repeats it, adding some more detail. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. So, this is about God showing us He loves us. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to say to Him, prove it. Because he tells us, I have proven it. Here it is for all to read and to know. And so this morning, briefly, let's, let's consider this. God shows us that he loves us. God shows us that he loves us. Three points. First of all, God sent us his son. That's how God shows us he loves us. He sent us his son. Now John himself makes this clear, doesn't he? Verse 9 and 10. God has sent his only begotten Son, into the world. And then God sent His Son. We're so familiar with these terms that we sometimes miss the significance and the glory of them. John is saying, this is how you know God loves you. He sent you His Son. His Son. His only Son. That is, His only natural and eternal Son. It is true that believers also become sons and daughters of God. We confess that on the basis of God's word. Behold what manner of love that we should be called sons of God or children of God. But the son is son in a class all by himself. The son is God's only begotten son. He has been son since forever. He is the natural and eternal, <laughs> eternal Son of the Father. And so that sets him apart, and that means he must be very special to the Father. And of course he is. He is the dearly beloved Son of God. He is God's greatest joy and delight and treasure. And now we read that God sent him into this world, and God sent him to us. Truly, that is a proclamation of the great love of God. You know, we don't have to give a lot to show love to each other. We know that from family life. Sometimes little gifts, thoughtful gifts can say a lot. That's true. It doesn't have to be big to mean something. It's also true that you can give big gifts that really don't mean anything. If, if there's no thought behind them and there's no, no love behind them, that's also true. So it's not necessarily the size of the gift, little or big, but when we are talking about God who is pure and perfect, and God saying, I will give you my son, my one and only son, I will send him to you in the world. Well, what else can that be but a proclamation, a proof, a declaration of his love? And that's what John is telling us. And this is love. And this is love, that God sent His Son. Again, let's not miss the significance of sent. Sent. It's not like the Son slipped out when the Father wasn't looking, or when the Father was busy with something else, if that's even possible to talk like that, and the Son just kind of got out on His own, as it were. That's not how it happened. Nor should we think that the Son, too, was just busy with other things, and in his business, he happened to come across the world, and maybe maybe he should do something about that. Maybe he should talk to the Father. No, it, it, it's nothing like that. It's, it's God sent his Son. So that speaks to intention and purpose, and God taking action, and God seeing the need of this world, and knowing the state of his people, and being so aware of how we are fallen sons and daughters of Adam and lost and left to ourselves in the greatest of trouble. And the Father knew all that. And so 
We read in the Word of God, we, we know from God's Word that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit too, the triune God drafted a plan, and it's an eternal plan. And the Father took the initiative, and we can say it like this, the Father decided, as it were, what He will do. He will send His Son. He will say to His Son, I'm sending you into the world. There in the world, sinners need a Savior, and I want to send you. The Son consented to it. The Son said, I will go, and the Holy Spirit approved it all. And that is what happened, and that is what John is describing. And that is the great wonder that we know as Christmas, what the Bible describes elsewhere like this, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. God sent Him into our space-time world. God sent His one and only Son. And it is this point, John is telling us, that speaks to His love and helps to confirm it and declare it. And let's always remember that. We live in a world which can seem so lost and, and so out of control. and Our own lives can e easily be in upheaval and turmoil. And sometimes in the midst of it all, we can wonder, is, is there a God and does He care? And then we only need to remember the incarnation. God, send us His Son. And John would say to us, never forget that. And never forget what it means. He is a God who has love for you. But as we know, it didn't stop with sending His Son. God sent Him. And secondly, God sacrificed Him. God sacrificed His Son. And this is what is in view in verse 10, especially when, when John says, God sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, whatever does that mean, propitiation? It would be a good spelling word for maybe, I don't know, grade 5 or 6 or something. It's a big word. It's not a, it's not a common word, that's true. But you know, it's an important word. And what it refers to is, is simply a sacrifice that turns away anger or wrath and obtains favor instead. That's what propitiation means. That's what it is all about, a sacrifice that turns away wrath and obtains favor. Now here we have to ask the question, why did there ever need to be a sacrifice that turns away wrath and obtains favor? Why did God have to send His Son to be sacrificed? And the answer, as we well know, the answer is that we are all sinners and sinful before God. And the consequence of that is that God is very displeased with us. He is rightfully angry and wrathful towards us. And what we deserve is that He would simply unleash His wrath upon us forever. We cannot escape this reality. Though many have tried, and though the modern church has in, in, in many respects tried to and, and succeeded even in leaving this behind in their teaching. They've hollowed out the Scripture and emptied out the significance of the sacrifice of the Son of God. It's wrong to do it. You can't be a faithful Christian and do it. The Bible tells us that God is rightfully angry with sinners. In the Old Testament, for instance, we meet, someone has counted up the idea of the wrath of God. We meet that concept almost 600 times. 600 times almost. Just the Old Testament speaks about God's judgment and wrath for sin and for sinners. It's what we deserve on account of our sins. It's what you deserve. It's what I deserve. And isn't it true that part of what it means to be a Christian is that we know this and we, and we confess this. We don't shy away from this. We don't try to hide this point. But we are on this, like we, we sang it from Psalm 51 when we read the law. How we are born in evil and sin. And how we deserve wrath and judgment. Because if God should mark our sins, our sins. Maybe this past week you have considered that again in part of your preparation for the table, the supper. And it's true that it can be almost crushing, can it? When, when we think about particular sins in our life. Or, or when we consider just how careless we can be spiritually so often. 
But now what John is telling us is that God sent his son to bear that anger and wrath that we deserved. God sent his son to satisfy every claim of divine justice and righteousness. God sent his son so that through the son all the sin debts of all his people can be fully paid. And as a result, he is no longer angry with us. But he is warm towards us. He no longer stands poised with a sword over us to destroy us. But he opens wide his arms to receive us and to bless us. God sent his son to accomplish that. And how did his son accomplish that? Through his being sacrificed. It is through God sacrificing his son in the stead, in the place, or as a substitute for all his people. That's what the Bible everywhere teaches from the Old Testament offerings, to the prophecies, to the words of Christ himself, to the teaching of the apostles, Jesus, the Son of God, was delivered up for our offenses. He was delivered up so that what ought to fall on you, on me, fell forever, fell infinitely so on him, on him. That's the whole story of the suffering and the crucifixion, and ultimately the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was all that about? It was about the Son being the propitiation. It was about the Father sacrificing the Son, and the Son on the Son unleashing all of His wrath and judgment as we deserve it, pouring it out upon His Son, making the Son to feel it, and to absorb it, and to exhaust it. We can't measure that. It was infinite weight. It was infinite wrath. But God made his son to bear it in all of its fullness and to finish it. And again, why? Why did God do that? Well, John John is taking us back to the very heart of it because he loves us. It's because he doesn't want to see us die as we deserve. And so he sent us his son to be the propitiation. He sent his son to be sacrificed. Christmas climaxes at Calvary. And therein is God's love. What's more, the great call of the gospel we know is to believe in the Son of God. Those who can count themselves among the loved of God ultimately are those who by his grace turn to him and trust him. And so the call of the gospel, as we read throughout the scriptures, is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe that he is the Son of God, that he was crucified, that he is risen, that he is the sacrifice that God has set forth for sin and for sinners. And when we so believe, then the promise of the Lord, and here we come to our last point, the promise, the the great wonder and promise is that God saves through his Son. God saves through his Son. Here we go back to the last words of verse 9. That we might live through him. So God sent his son. That's earlier in verse 9. God sent him. And again verse 10. God sent him and to be the propitiation. And what's it all for? It's that we might live through him. Why does John put it like that? That we might live through the son of God. Why does John describe salvation in those terms. Isn't it because apart from the Son of God and apart from His saving work on the cross and then through His Spirit in our life, apart from that, we are, we are dead, really. We are spiritually dead. Now, no one gets this by nature. No one understands it left to himself. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us, to open our eyes, Personally, sinners are, through sin and evil, dead before God. And even though we live in this world, it's not for long, really. And then we die. And if we are not covered by the saving work of the Son of God, if we are not united to Him as our life, then we don't just die, but we forever die. We forever suffer under the judgment and wrath of God. But it is through faith in the Son of God what happens is that we, we are made alive. In fact, it is, ready, it is already through his power that we, we, 
we turn to him and trust in him, it is already through his, his life-giving work in us that we, we wake up to our need and begin to seek him. And when we so trust in him, then we find out that, that this is life. And not simply in terms of life in this world. That's true. There's already so much more to enjoy when we are alive in the Son of God. Just living in this world. But ultimately, the secret to it is that we have now relationship to God. And we live at peace with Him. And we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we have a hope of being eternal life. We, we look forward to everlasting life with the Lord. And even when we come to die, as, as we must in this world, believers don't really die. Jesus taught that elsewhere when He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he who believes in me will never die. Because death is simply a doorway into everlasting life. And that is why John says that we might live through him. Because, because that's true. Because that's the essence of salvation. To come from death into life. And that is what God does. And John is saying, and all of it is proof of his love. In this is love. Not that we love God. When we talk about the love of God and, and, and loving God, we should always remember it begins with Him loving us. And how we know that is that He sent His Son and sacrificed His Son and He saves us through His Son. And it's for all God's people and every believer can be sure of it. You know, we can struggle with many doubts about ourselves. That's true. We ought never struggle with doubts about Him about the Lord, about His love, because He has declared it. And because to all who turn to Him and trust in Him, He would guarantee it. In Him, we find everlasting love. Well, that's what He tells us in His Word. As He turns our eyes, as He turns our eyes, as it were, to the stable and to the manger and then to the cross, and then to the empty tomb, and then to the events of the Ascension and Pentecost. In Him is life, and in Him we are loved. That's what He tells us. What a privilege that not only this morning do we get to hear it, but through the supper He now says to us, and I want you to taste it, and I want you to enjoy it. Isn't that what happens? Through the bread and the wine, Simple signs and seals of the promise of God, of the loving kindness of our God. How grateful we can be that the Lord sets this before us again this morning. And my fellow believers then, as we hear of God's great love, and as we know it through the gospel, let us, through the bread and the wine, eat and drink, and be all the more assured how much our God loves us. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, loving and gracious God, we confess that you are beyond our ability to understand and even to express. But we hold fast to the words you have given. The words that Tell us that you are a God of love and that we can know that because you have sent your Son and because you have sacrificed your Son and because you save through your Son even all those who turn to you and trust in you. All those who confess they cannot do without you and they look to you and they love you. And we acknowledge too, O Lord, that when we love you, it's because you first loved us. As we consider these familiar and wonderful themes, we pray that you will seal them to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Simply through the word, O Lord, comfort us as we seek to rest in your love. And then also through the sacrament, assure us further and strengthen us as we eat and drink in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we remember that therein, in Him, we see your love. 
Hear our prayer and help us now and bless us for your name's sake and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. As we partake of these very simple elements, we remember that the Lord is conveying something so profound and wonderful, almost more than we can fathom and even rightfully express. He loves us. He loves us. What I want to do as we, as we close, really, is and with meditation, just read a few verses from the Gospel and then from Isaiah reminding us of the way the Lord has shown us this love. Mark 15, first of all. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And John proclaims in this is love.